So hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are joining us in the world. I myself am in London and it is a glorious day here, which is very exciting. Um, but I'm also really excited about our session today. So this is the sixth in our Central Developer Skills Series for Laravel Developers. And today is all about making planning scope of work successful. And it's going to be presented by our fantastic solutions architect, David Murray. Uh, for those of you who are new to this series of webinars, I'm Dan, I'm going to be your host for today. I've got a few introductory and house rule slides to go through before we get to the main bulk of today's session. And this just also give a chance for later on us to come on board um, before we, yeah, really get started. So a bit of introduction to CyberDuck. Um, so we're actually Laravel's first official UK accredited partner. And if you were to ask us, why do you do what you do? Well, we are super passionate about making digital products, services, and websites more user-friendly, more accessible, and served by better open source technology like Laravel. And as you can see on the slide here, a few of the different clients we've worked with over the years from NHS to Bosch to Sport England, you know, great clients, fantastic stories. And that really brings us on to why we started to do this series of webinars. So, I mean, we've been an agency now for, you know, over a decade and you know all of us have been working you know even longer than that so we collectively took all of our, our knowledge you know we're talking years and years worth and over these years we've been building up processes expertise and knowledge ways of working that we really want to share the way wider world and particularly with those developers who are looking to grow and elevate their skills outside of pure development so what does this look like well, in each of these webinars that we're running, uh, a different member of CyberDuck will be talking on sort of a different stage of the project lifecycle. So for those who have joined before, you would have heard us talking about things like UX and accessibility around pitching and strategy. And we've got a lot more ones coming up as well around things like QA and Agile. So it's really fantastic stuff to keep an eye out for. Each of these sessions are recorded. So if for whatever reason you're not able to make one in the future, don't worry. We make sure these are uploaded onto our YouTube page and shared out with everyone who's registered. And alongside that, we'll also be sharing with you some additional material when relevant. So got a couple of other last house rule slides to go through. We've got about 40 minutes booked out for our session today. Uh, there will be time available towards the end of our session today for any questions you have for David. So please keep those uh, saved up. As I said already, we'll be recording our session. So please just keep a look out in your inbox for an email from us. And that will give you a chance to go to our YouTube playlist, catch up with this one, as well as our previous webinars as well. If you do want to ask David a question, the best way to do this is using the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should hope to see a Q&A button. If you click that, the Q&A window will pop up and you can just ask what you want there. You can also post any questions to Twitter and LinkedIn. We love seeing content out on social media. So yeah, please feel free to post whether it's question, whether it's you wanting to share something you've learned from today's session and just use the hashtag Lara Duck and then we'll be able to pick up on that and engage with you there as well. And then the last slide from me is just around captioning. So automated captions are available. If these are not already turned on, you can do so using the transcript button. Again, that should be located at the bottom of your screen. And also the on-demand version of the webinar will be provided with manually edited captions as well. As we know, automated captions, they're, they're not perfect. And so that's everything from me for now. So I'm going to say a big hello to David. Uh, good afternoon. And yeah, great if you can get started with our session today. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, great intro there. Um, as uh, Dan mentioned, I'm David Murray. I'm a solution architect here at CyberDuck. Um, I joined recently. I have uh, 30 years or so of experience. I started way back in the day on desktop support uh, down in the trenches, uh, progressed through network engineering, third line server support. I owned an agency for 10 years or so doing end to end lifecycle development of web projects um, and then consulted for several years after that until recently now I've actually joined CyberDuck as a wonderful team of very talented people. So. Today, we're going to talk about planning and the measure twice, cut once. So we're going to go through a series of slides where I'm going to discuss the different types of the development lifecycle with different steps of the development lifecycle and detail the type of things we should be thinking about and planning in order to make our projects run more smoothly, more cost effectively um, and develop, develop, deliver value as soon as possible. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is, is what do you look at when you kickstart a new project? 
And kickstarting a new project is understanding why are we doing this? Um, it's important for all of the stakeholders, all of the developers, all of the resources working within the project to understand the drivers for the project. Is it to increase sales or leads? Is it to improve awareness about the brand? Is it to provide value, um, at value added services? Um, and it's important that the entire team understands what the direction of the development is about. And that allows us to plan for it in, in a much better way. Um, we'll understand what the roadmap looks like and which direction we should be going. Now, the, the first step is always getting the stakeholder buy-in. So depending on whether you're uh, internal to a company and you work on a product and um, you have to justify OKRs or you're trying to justify an internal project you'd like to work on, um, or if you have clients and you need to send a proposal to them, um, the first thing or the most important thing they're going to look at is your time and uh, cost estimates. Everything is driven by money. And the only way that we can get ex uh, accurate estimates, and that's the important word here, accurate estimates, is making sure that we planned correctly. So when we start putting our plans together, the most important, well, one of the first things to look at is, are we building the right thing? Um, usually what we'd be doing is uh, we're building a responsive website and we'll say, that's no problem. We'll take care of all the devices um, from mobile to you know, large iMac screens. It will be hunky-dory. I think what's important to look at is, should this, be, uh, should this application be everything or uh, to, to all users, or is it better suited to being only an application on a phone? Because that could save a lot of development time and return a lot of value to the customer at a lot less cost. It can also be a case of, um, is the data too rich to fit on mobile devices? This could be a reporting application, which is extremely data dense, and it doesn't make sense to have on any mobile devices. It will only be for desktop and up. Again, limiting the scope of what we're doing and remaining very focused and not driving up costs. Um, there could be instances where we don't even need to build this. If we consider it and we plan and we've looked at it carefully, this could be taken care of by a marketing campaign. It's not something that should be developed into a brochureware website because it would have far more of an effective reach in traditional media, in social media, et cetera. So going through all of the next slides, we're gonna, as I mentioned, focus on avoiding re-engineering. And that same saves times and costs. And that's what allows us to give value back to our shareholders. So the first thing we'll look at when we're planning our projects is who's the target audience? Um, do you have a good understanding of this? It's, it's often, um, it's often the, uh, the stakeholders or the initiators of a new project who think that they have the most wonderful idea in the world and this is going to make the millions and they're going to retire to an island. Um, this is not necessarily always the case. So the first thing we need to do is, do we know that our customers actually want this product? and need this product. So there are drivers internally, but now we need to know, are there drivers externally? And in part of our plan, we're gonna to need to understand, do people want this product? And we're gonna to have to do customer interviews. Customer interviews take time. You have to orchestrate them. You have to get people to interview. You have to process the data. Um, during this time, you would no doubt also be doing persona interviews. Find out who that audience it is that looking for your product. Are they younger? Are they professionals? Is it narrow interest? Um, all of these things will determine how you're going to place and put your content together. If it's, um, if, if it's a young, young audience that are looking for places to go partying, they might be searching on an accommodation type of site in Ibiza, and it needs to be very heavily focused on search and easy navigation. Alternatively, it could be uh, deep dive information that they're after, or it could be a sector specific. It could be biotech in which case you need to know that all of your content will probably be very technical and that's what your information architecture and your content creators are going to have to be focusing on. Um, so now that we've established we have an audience and what they're looking for and we've established that there are drivers and there's, there's viability to our project, the next thing we need to know is, you know, how are we going to get people there? Because if we, um, you can build it, but they won't necessarily come in the... Uh, in the famous words of, oh, I can't remember what that movie was, but anyway. Um, so we need to make sure that we're going to be taking into account our planning for social media, for SEO, for paid media, 
Now, all of these have a tangible effect on how our planning works. A, it escalates costs, and B, it has a material effect on the way we develop things. Um, it's, we need, we're going to need to interlace search engine optimization, keyword densities, et cetera, through the content that we build. We're going to need to see that the content architecture facilitates those keyword densities and things that we're after to maximize our search engine optimization in getting people to the site. So it's important that that is planned up front and that it doesn't become an afterthought that we now have to, again, re-engineer the thing we're desperately trying to um, avoid doing. Next in our fantastic step of planning is looking at, okay, great, we, we, we have a viable product, we're getting people to the website, but can they actually do what they want to do? Can they successfully navigate around our web estate? The masses are breaking the door down and can they get to what they need? Um, uh, Many years ago, we took on a distressed project in the tourism industry, and um, we had a site that was very heavily search engine optimized and was bringing in a lot of traffic. But the danger was that uh, the site wasn't put together particularly well. We had come in to try and fix this. And as a result, their conversions were terrible. So extremely high views, but not very good uh, conversions. And that is where it illustrated that the, the UX was really, really bad. And this is the next topic, which is UX and journey mapping um, and making that, and that is vital to the conversions within our site. So whether it's a lead generation uh, or getting someone to buy a specific product or uh, interact with a new tool that you've created, et cetera, UX and the journey mapping is vital. Um, and this can take significant amount of time as well. Again, flowing into our process and our planning and making sure that everything is flowing properly. Adjustments in um, user journeys can have a very nasty ripple effect down the line, as we know. Um, to bring it into a development context, any of you out there who've developed multi-step forms know what a pain this can be. If um, you've got a front end, which is posting forms as they're being filled into a back end, which is populating a database, possibly calling APIs, if you now suddenly have to re-engineer that entire multi-step form, it has a very large ripple effect um, and it can create sort of exponential hours added on that weren't planned for initially. The next topic that I'd like to address is uh, accessibility. So we've got our user journeys, which are working great and everyone can find what they want, but that's what's important. Can everyone find what they want? Um, I think a lot of people are completely unaware that up to 20% of their audience have challenges digesting the information and getting to it. Um, it's often thought that it's a much lower amount or people just are unaware. And it, it's vital that you do cater for that audience, especially depending on the sector that you're in. You know, if, you're, if you are developing in the government sector, it's mandatory. So you had better thought of this up front. Um, otherwise, again, a lot of work going back through all of your code, trying to integrate. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, in our measure twice, cut once, integrate and interlace things when they needed, as they needed, and not recurse back to do them. So um, implementing WCAG standards, uh, as we mentioned, can take a lot of time and a lot of effort. If you want to know more about this, uh, the previous episode in our series was from Ramon, one of our experts in UX and um, accessibility, and he gives us a, a, an excellent breakdown of how that works. So I strongly recommend checking that, that episode out. Um, it can have a tangible effect as well, as opposed to just recursing back and changing the code, um, you get uh, very difficult, uh, well, difficult interlacing, like navigation and uh, complex interactions like date pickers. Um, these can take significant amounts of time to make WCAG uh, compliant. Um, and you need to do testing, which is, again, another thing which will add into the timing required um, for the project and something that should be costed for upfront. Again, if you'll remember in, our, in my, my first slide that I did, is we were mentioning about giving accurate costings. These are those little things that can very easily be a afterthought, which can escalate costing, and it's never fun going cap in hand back to your stakeholders requesting more money because you have run out of time. So up until this point, we've been basically dealing with the, uh, the front end of the website and sort of strategy type concerns, so softer skills. But uh, especially for our audience, our Laravel audience here, the back office, as we know, um, where a lot of it happens, it's the engine room. Um, your, your web app or your app or your website, your app is often just the front door. 
um, there's usually a huge uh, complex set of services that lie behind it. And uh, this is where time can explode if you're not watching carefully, um, especially if you have a lot of third party external integrations, API integrations, it can take significant plumbing for that. Uh, one of the things that always gets overlooked is, yes, we'll just integrate with partner A or partner B via API. But as we all know, you know, there's a significant amount of time that goes into investigating what that API can do, how you should be able to interact with it. And uh, over and beyond that, we have the case of babysitting APIs. Um, we all know that there's not a case, it's, it's not simply the case of get the API in place, set it running, and it, it'll look after itself. That's never how it works. Um, we need to have interfaces which allow us to debug that, interfaces which allow us to see is the data flowing, how do we rectify it, what errors did we get, um, escalation policies, if it's broken on our side, SLAs on their side, how quickly they're going to get it up and running so that we can pump through transactions that are waiting to go down those pipelines. Um, so this I can strongly main, recommend API developers, well, Laravel developers working on timing and planning is one of your biggest uh, hidden costs that needs to be taken into account. Um, as we all know, it's it's not just code on the back end. It's, uh, it's also people. There's an entire back office that resides behind this that delivers the services. Um, inquiries may come through websites, but generally the servicing of those inquiries and the customer experience very strongly happens with the people who are fulfilling those services behind the website. And it's important to make sure that those people are upskilled they understand and, and, and uh, uh, know what they're expecting to get from the system, how the data comes out of the system. And again, like with the API developers, how do they escalate when they're having problems and when things are not being processed? Um, it's, it's vitally important that the support and escalation, escalation communication lines are very clear. And uh, on the topic of people, which is our next slide, um, as you can see, we've got a lot of people who've been in the mix at the moment. Um, we've got UX, we've got SEO, search engine marketing, PEM. We've got back-end developers, front-end developers, strategy. And it takes time to orchestrate all of these people and make sure they're available at the right time. Um, it's If you don't upfront book these people in time and you don't make sure they're blocked out and that the plan is running according to, to the plan, then you, that is where you can end up with significant problems. It's important to have a look in what dependencies you have and what dependencies they have and make sure those are daisy chained and that you have checkpoints at regular intervals um, to make sure everything is on time. Uh, tell people, oh, I don't actually need you next week. The project's been held up by a week. Could you possibly resource a, a little bit later down the line? Because that ripple effect, you are just the beginning of a tree of changes that happen. They may have, they have other projects they're working on. They need to move the dependencies of those projects, et cetera. Um, and those time lags, as we know, in comms is again going to cause us time, which causes money, which again is what our shareholders are not going to love in our uh, estimations that we've given them. So now that we have the right people working on the right thing and we're building the right tool, um, one of the things that's super important is KPIs. Are you measuring things? Because whether you have a greenfields project, in which case you're quite lucky, you're starting afresh, or if you're building on an existing system, the chances are you're going to have to justify and show the uptick that you're generating through the work and the value that you're giving. And um, as I mentioned previously, uh, with the example that I gave you with the website visitors and inquiries, um, the website visitors is not a good metric if you're looking at the usability on the website. However, it is a good metric if you're looking for SEO. So it's important to define the right KPIs to measure the right things. Um, it's important to revisit those KPIs regularly on each iteration um, and make sure that those sessions are planned in. So again, um, what I'd like to emphasize here is those things that get forgotten in the master plans like KPI um, uh, evaluation sessions. How are we doing? How is that happening? Because all of those are costed for and should attribute to the end goal and the end budget uh, that's going on. So now to the fun part, which is uh, code and infrastructure. Um, and I think this is probably particularly uh, um, applicable to the audience we have here today, but making sure your code is able to grow without over-engineering it is key. Do the measure it twice, uh, cut once. Um, you can only know this if your plan is 
detailed enough and everybody is on board with that plan. So making sure that, for example, on the front end, uh, you are using a specific uh, library, a UI library, but you may not be using that library for forever. You may be de de developing your own one. It's just a stopgap at the moment. Then it makes sense to say, okay, we're going to develop wrapper components, which will wrap those third-party libraries and allow us to interchange and swap without having to rewrite our entire code base. That is the type of thing we need to look at in terms of measuring twice and cutting once is uh, limiting the time that we have to do re-engineering. Exactly the same thing in the back end is does our core logic reside in one place? Are we making sure they're abstracted to services so that we can use them where, need, where they're needed and they're not tied to controllers, et cetera? Um, we have a very large project uh, internally that deals with the logistics. And when they started, they only had one or two providers, but now they have several providers. So if we hadn't built that project, making use of the strategy pattern and composable architectures, we wouldn't be able to hot plug all of those different uh, DHL and um, um, all of the other uh, delivery providers that we make use of in the logistics space. Uh, similarly, in the hardware space, if you don't engineer the website correctly, so for example, you're building an MVP and in building that MVP, you're trying to keep the cost as low as possible. And this is where we talk about not over-engineering, but also not under-engineering and making sure that you keep an eye on the future, is if your sessions are disk-based, you've now, and this is one of many different attributes you could have, you've now crippled your ability to horizontally scale your application. Because every time a user hits that, uh, that instance of the server, it needs to either have a sticky load balancing to make sure they end up on exactly the same server they were originally, um, or you're going to have sessions dying and people being logged in, logged out, because you've now scaffolded serious, uh, several instances of the website and it's not written to actually be horizontally scaled. Um, so key, key component is to integrate in your development cycle or your base templates that you use for new projects, the, the 12 factors, 12 steps, I think they call it, which you can look up. It's an excellent thing about how to make things ephemeral so that servers can literally be expunged and rebuilt with Kubernetes, et cetera, without affecting sessions and flow. Um, uh, it's a vital thing to integrate. Even if you're building an MVP, make sure that you use those principles to allow you to scale very quickly. Because if one goes, the MVP should be cheap. Um, you know, we'll build later, we'll get more budget. But in the majority of projects that I've worked on, it tends to scale up really quickly. And even if you do have budget, it's very seldom that you re-engineer everything. You tend to extend on what you have. So making sure that you're prepared and ready for that is, is invaluable. Um, on top of that is provisioning. If we're talking about the back end and infrastructure, is have you secured DevOps? You know, DevOps are usually those poor guys in the back room who get everything thrown at them and they're not always easy to get hold of. If your projects are gonna, you know, have to get going um, rapidly, you're gonna need to make sure that amongst your people, those are one of the key, key people you've uh, provisioned early on in the project to make sure that your pipelines and projects are ready for development as soon as possible. So the last bit, which is what most of us developers hate, is documentation. Unfortunately, it is probably one of the most um, important aspects in planning, because what document documentation does is it documents the decisions we've made chronologically. And this is vitally important, whether it's in your, only in your internal company or if you're dealing with external clients, knowing what decision you made when is, is, is really critical, because it's something you can refer back to and it doesn't, it gives a measure of scope group. It's very easy to point to that and say, that's what we did do. And then you told us to change it to this and that's what we did do then, et cetera. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing because it also provides transparency to all of your stakeholders. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with the C4 model, um, which is what I'm showing here, um, it's where you document based on the level of your audience. On the far left-hand side here, we have executives. So it needs to be very high level. They don't want to know the detail. They just want to know exactly how things are semi going to hang together and work and will, when is it delivered, et cetera. Um, off onto our far right-hand side here, which is down to developer level, where everything is documented in the finest detail, exactly how does that logic work? Where is it stored? How should it be executed? And how has it changed over time? We have a, um, 
we have a very specific way of creating tickets here at Cyberduck, and that is um, almost a mini planning element. So what I mean by that is that within our tickets, we have a series of things. We want to understand, refine, and then make ready the ticket to make sure that there is no misunderstandings and no repetition. Again, the measuring twice, cutting once. So our tickets have, uh, I'll read these sections that I've got. We've got a situation, and the situation describes what is the current state of affairs? Because it's important for developers to understand the context as well. Often this can come down from you know, PMs or from, you know, from product managers or even the product owners, et cetera, without any context of why we're doing what we're doing. So it's just a micro um, repetition of the macro level that we've been talking about. So what is the situation is the first part. What is the complication? So what is the problem? What are we trying to solve? The next section is the solution. Okay, this is how we plan to fix it. Um, following that is quality and acceptance. Okay, so you fixed it. Exactly how am I guarantee it was fixed correctly and it's doing what it should do. That's quality and acceptance. And the final part, which is often, uh, well, the final two parts, which are not often, often in a ticket, is communication. Who needs to know about this? Often we'll have documentation, which is the other one that no one likes to do, making sure that it gets done in time with when we're developing the products and it doesn't become an afterthought. Because when it becomes an afterthought, it generally gets orphaned and forgotten, um, or we run out of budget, and then there's no time to do it, which again then leads to problems down the line with technical debt, people not understanding why things were done, etc. cetera. Um, but communication is often not on those tickets, and it's who should know what, when. You know, has something gone live? Has it not gone live? Et cetera. But again, those are many planning sessions, um, exactly the same as the macro topic that we're talking about here. So in summary, it comes down to um, the, number key, the number one key thing in all of your planning, and you measure twice, cut once, is communication. It covers all of these sectors that we've been talking about today. Um, and it's the way that we all stay aligned because what we do and why we developed agile practices in our industry is because we know that things change and they change all the time. And that means that the plan is changing. Um, so unless you're keeping an eye on the roadmap, and how that's changing, making sure that there's not possible pivots in the future, um, or monitoring your KPIs to make sure that you're actually staying online or you are actually delivering value based on the incremental changes that you're making, um, it becomes very different, difficult for you to plan in the future. Um, the initial onset of a project and initial development um, of a project to scaffold it and stand it up is only the first part of it. We all know nowadays that... Uh, Websites or web apps are pretty much like a, um, a living beast. They're like any other department. They're going to be going for as long as the business is. They need to be constantly re-engineered. They need to be constantly looked after. And what's important is that that becomes a pleasurable process and a profitable one at the same time. So the key to making sure that happens is planning. And uh, my closing statement on that one will be uh, to always measure twice and cut once. Thank you. I think we can probably move on to a Q&A session, Dan, if there are Yes. Any. Well, firstly, thank you so much for that, David. It was, uh, yeah, so insightful. Um, and something that I wanted to start with is, you know, there's, there's a lot there and a lot of different tasks to go through. So I guess first, you know, who is responsible for owning the planning and where, with our audience, where does the developer really kind of fit within this task? Um, Planning should actually be owned by everybody. This is, this is one of the symptomatic problems, I think, in a lot of agencies and a lot of um, uh, uh, industries is that planning is held conceptually in only a few individuals' minds and the rest of the people are just filling out small parts of that system. Um, it's way easier to, to execute your work if you have an understanding of why you're doing it and where you're heading. You know, I can always give the, I always give the analogy of, you know, if you just get dumped in the desert, it's really difficult because you don't know which direction to go and what to do. So you just start walking. And, you know, it's much easier if you're given a source and a destination. And that's what planning does for us. It gives us a source, why we're doing something. And it gives us a destination where we need to be at the end of this. So part of the planning, the planning, in, 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 especially in the context of a developer, they should be involved in a lot of the planning, maybe not the super high planning that uh, there's a strategic level at seaboard and higher, but I think every ticket, if we look at the Agile manifestos, should actually be developed or planned 
by the developers because they're closest to the code and they know what's possible. Um, it's also vitally important that you know developers um, generally will have a good business understanding as well, which means that they can feed up the chain to product owners and to product managers, allowing them to, to understand possibilities they are that they would not necessarily have known about previously. This is one of the reasons that clients come to us is because they don't know the technology. They're asking us to solve technological problems. And sometimes the best people to solve that are the actual developer. But uh, in short, planning sessions should be as collaborative as possible. I know we can't get everybody in every meeting. Um, that's why we have our documentation, but we need to sort of surface that plan to everybody. And the, the plan is the guideline and the road track we are all following together. We should all contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe to add to that, as you know, I said, you know, lots of people need to be involved in this. How easy is it for a developer to maybe challenge someone else within their team if they think, you know, maybe what they're proposing isn't isn't the right approach? This is generally a consensus issue because amongst developers, you know, we can have challenges in that you will have purists who want something done a very specific way because that's the way the book says it should be done. And we have pragmatists at the other end of the spectrum. And they're like, we just need to get it done, that's it. And the reality is the balance is in between. The balance is right in the middle, well, I'd say in the middle there. You know, we can't be absolute purists because we don't have infinite budget. But we also can't just get things out the door as quickly and, and, and shoddily as possible. We wanna make sure that we have standards we want to make sure that we have um, code consistency, that we are planning, et cetera. So in that instance, um, it's generally a consensus thing, okay? Because unfortunately, you, 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 there will be a best way to do it. And the more people that you have inputting on that and voting on that, you will arrive at, at probably the best way to achieve the goal. Um, it, the important thing is to try and remove uh, personal bias from those things which can be filtering it a lot of the time. I want it done this way, you want it done that way. You know, let's remove the personal bias from it, get as many people as we can in to comment on it and literally do, uh, I hazard to say, because it's so simple, a pros and cons, you know, which is the way we should do this. Do we have the budget? You know, does it make sense? Is it extensible? Is it extensible enough for now? Um, what we do is an art form. You know, many people wouldn't think that uh, coding is like, uh, uh, ballet or dancing or something, but it is. It's extremely creative and extremely fluid. That's fantastic. Uh, I definitely agree. Yes, developers, they are modern Picassos. Um, we've got some really great questions coming through, so I want to jump onto some of these. Um, and the first, again, is I think this nicely connects to what we've been discussing is around, you know, what types of different stakeholders should be involved in this sort of planning approach? Um, so we've got our developers who should be sitting alongside them when we're doing this scoping. Right at the beginning of the scoping, you need to get as many of the people you can into the same space. Um, we practice it here occasionally at, um, at CyberDuck, and I think a lot of other people do it. There's a great resource which is called Design Sprints. And with Design Sprints, at the initial onset of a project, and it can actually be done for re-engineering a project as well, you get all of the parties involved in that planning and in that session. So one would think you would just have the developers and maybe the product owner, but this system generally affects a lot of other people. So in that meeting, you should have representatives from marketing, you should have representatives from finance, um, people from DevOps, if you can. I know that often it's very difficult to orchestrate getting all of those people in. So it depends on what the complexity or how important that meeting is. You know, if, if it's the onset of a new project and you're designing something new, then it needs to be given the attention and the, 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 the energy that's required. Get everybody in the room because the, this is our planning twice, cutting once. We're going to make sure everybody's aligned and everything's fine. Otherwise, we end up with problems down the line where finance says, oh, our accounting system doesn't do that. And marketing goes, yeah, it's great that you got that out now, but we actually did the ad campaign six months ago. You know, that doesn't work. Um, on smaller jobs, uh, I think everyone who touches the ticket to a degree um, should be involved in it. Uh, it's important. But again, balancing act is that, uh, that fluidity that should be there. Mm, yeah, that's great. I've got another really fantastic question here as well is, have you ever had a situation where the planning process has thrown up some really big 
changes to the initial product or project scope and how was this managed? This happens more often than not, strangely, especially if you work in agile teams. Um, the whole reason that the agile manifesto and agile came about, irrespective of whether you use Kanban or Crystal or Scrum or whatever method you're using, is to deal with change, is to, to say things are going to pivot really quickly. What we need to do is stay in control of that. So your sprint goals in most of these uh, frameworks will be one specific thing. And only if there's a very serious problem will you abandon that sprint goal and change route. But the whole point of developing code or developing functionality features, et cetera, in small increments and showing value is that at the end of those increments, you can evaluate your KPIs, you can evaluate what the market is dictating and you can pivot. You know, so it, it needs to be part of your standard workflow. You should be expecting change as opposed to expecting no change. You know, it's very seldom, if you're not getting any change and you're just plodding along, you're probably going to find something's wrong. Either you're going to become redundant at some stage or you're going to become obsolete as a product because you're not changing. You know, unfortunately, one of the things that I say that I love about my job is the one thing that I hate about my job, which is there's always something new. You know, I love learning something new and I love the change, but occasionally I was like, please, if we could just stop for a day or two, it would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, change is the nature of what we do. We need to embrace it and get the mechanics and systems necessary to manage it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer to that. Uh, I just want to finish up on one more question, which is, you know, we've all been in instances where, you know, we're told, you know, the deadline's very tight, we just need to get started. So, you know, how do we push back when planning is being skipped or even just rushed? I think this the, this is one of the key uh, places where you can use budget as a uh, as a whip, not as a whip. Uh, that's a wrong term, I suppose. Um, generally, in most instances, when we're doing things, it's for profit, of some reason, be it money, be it uh, increased audience, be it anything. But generally, it involves it involves a, a value, a monetary input into it, and the stakeholders and shareholders in those different ventures will be extremely concerned about ROI. Okay, it will be their number one imperative. They need to show, you know, stakeholders need to show value to shareholders in most instances, list, listed companies. And if you are a small startup, you have limited budget. So you want to get the maximum possible value you can get from that. But in both of these instances, as I mentioned, it's coming back to money. Um, an easy way to push back on that is exactly what I've summarized today is if you don't plan properly, you are going to spend more. If you just dive into something, you are guaranteed to spend more and sometimes a lot more and not deliver any value unless you planned. I think if as long as you're talking to the right person with the right authority who understands that, you shouldn't have that problem. Um, again, it needs to be a pragmatic approach. You can't plan forever. You need to put a cap to the amount of planning that you do. Um, again, it's that dynamic nature. So I know it doesn't, there's no hard and fast answer to it. But in that instance, pushing back against skipped planning is a combination of cash, because shareholders don't like spending money and stakeholders. And the second one is as a developer, you don't want to be spending late nights fixing systems on the on the edge of you know go launch and go live date because you didn't plan properly. You know, nobody secured the DevOps guys to provision things. You know, oops, we forgot the analytics. Get the analytics guy in quickly because we've got to try and get analytics on this thing quickly. No, nobody wants to live a life like that. So I think there's, there are many justifications you can make to not skip planning. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic one. And I think we'll start to look to wrap up after, after that. So just a bit of information on our next session. Uh, so... Uh, next session, and it's great that you did talk about this, uh, David, towards the end as well, just is going to be around agile working practices and brilliant communication. Uh, we haven't got a date confirmed, so just keep an eye out in your inbox for any information on that. In the meantime, we also have our white paper. I know a lot of people who have joined our sessions have already downloaded this. It's a great size piece of what we've been talking about throughout these webinars. Um, it goes a little bit more into depth, so you can either download it by the QR code 
on the screen right now. Otherwise, please feel free to reach out to us or go directly to our website and you'll be able to find it there. And that's it. So thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much, David, for our webinar. Really great, uh, again, session. So thank you and goodbye, everyone.